Our reading this morning comes from Job chapter 5. We're going to begin in verse 8. Job 5, beginning in verse 8. As for me, I would seek God, and to God would I commit my cause, who does great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. He gives rain on the earth and sends waters on the fields. He sets on high those who are lowly, and those who mourn are lifted to safety. He frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands achieve no success. He catches the wise in their own craftiness, and the schemes of the wily are brought to a quick end. They meet with darkness in the daytime and grope at noonday as in the night. But he saves the needy from the sword of their mouth and from the hand of the mighty. So the poor have hope and injustice shuts her mouth. Behold, blessed is the one whom God reproves. Therefore, despise not the discipline of the Almighty. For he wounds, but he binds up. He shatters, but his hands heal. He will deliver you from six troubles. In seven, no evil shall touch you. In famine, he will redeem you from death and in war from the power of the sword. You shall be hidden from the lash of the tongue and shall not fear destruction when it comes. At destruction and famine you shall laugh and shall not fear the beasts of the earth. For you shall be in league with the stones of the field, and the beasts of the field shall be at peace with you. You shall know that your tent is at peace, and you shall inspect your fold and miss nothing. You shall know also that your offspring shall be many, and your descendants as the grass of the earth. You shall come to your grave in a ripe old age, like a sheaf gathered up in its season." Behold, this we have searched out. It is true. Hear and know it for your good. Let us pray. Righteous Heavenly Father, we thank you for preserving the example of Job and his three friends, such as an example as it is. Uh, we pray, Father, that you will be with us as we consider Job and his troubles and the answers given to him by his friends uh, that we might learn ourselves how not uh, to address someone who is in affliction. A righteous Father, we pray that you grant us wisdom in this. And we know, Father, that you are the one who gives wisdom and that you bestow your gifts liberally. And so, Father, we pray for you to pour your wisdom out on us in this matter. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So this is the, the last message that I've got planned in our, uh, our series on anxiety. And the, the last thing that I want us to consider is I, wanna, I want to flip things around a little bit. We've been talking about different experiences of, of anxiety and what the scriptures tell us about how to handle those things whenever we are in them. Um, the last thing that I'd like us to consider in this is how we treat matters from the outside. How we, uh, how we treat people who uh, suffer, how we counsel people who suffer. Um, and there, there are a couple of different angles that we'll be covering this from, uh, since there are a couple of different ways in which we use that word anxiety. And we've been talking about this uh, really since the beginning of this series. One of the, the problems with modern discussions about anxiety is that we use it as a loose word to refer really to too many things. Um, sometimes what we call anxiety is simply distress that we are experiencing. Uh, such as Jesus in his experience in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, it might be more helpful for us to think of those experiences just as suffering. But as we, again, as we've been pointing out, people commonly call those things anxiety, that if you're, if you're actually suffering in the midst of suffering, if you are distressed in the midst of distress, uh, sometimes people label that anxiety and then treat people who suffer from it as though they were guilty of sin. 
We've talked about how inappropriate that is. Um, and we, we talk about um, anxiety from a few different angles as well. Uh, but I want us to go ahead and, and talk about anxiety in that first sense before we go any further. Uh, because our reading this morning touches on that first sense. Um, and it has turned out that um, uh, this word was more timely than I intended for it to be. Um, but of course, we know it's, it's not my intention that counts. So I hope this morning that we hear the word of the Lord and apply it with wisdom and discretion. So our reading this morning touches on that first sense. That Job has lost everything. He's lost all of his possessions. He's lost his livelihood. He's lost all his children. He's lost his own health. Right, now, nobody calls Job anxious because he's not dreading anything at this point in the story. His suffering is all behind him. His, his catastrophe is behind him, we should say, by the time of this reading. Uh, but Job's three friends speak to him in his distress in the same way that we might be tempted to speak to a brother or sister who is experiencing a different kind of distress and, and might be in the middle of it and... Uh, having some anxious feelings over that distress that they are in. And so I want us to consider the example of Job's friends this morning. There's a common saying about Job's friends that I think is true, and I think it's worth dwelling on here. Go to Job chapter 2. And we'll begin in verse 11. This is where Job's three friends first come on the scene in the story. So up to this point, it's just been loss and destruction. And Job is sitting in sackcloth and ashes. And his wife has had enough of all of this. Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die, she says. But there Job sits in his suffering, and we read, beginning in chapter 2, verse 11, Now when Job's three friends heard of all this evil that had come upon him, they came each from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite. They made an appointment together to come to show him sympathy and to comfort him. And when they saw him from a distance, they did not recognize him. And they raised their voices and wept. And they tore their robes and sprinkled dust on their heads toward heaven. And they sat with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his suffering was very great. It is commonly said that this represents, this is Job's friends at their most useful, at their most helpful, and it's true. These three men are most helpful in this book when they sit with Job, join him in his misery, and keep their mouths shut. Most of the chapters of this book consist of their speeches, and of course that's where things go off the rails. But there are some good things that we can learn from them here in Job chapter 2. And so let's, let's dwell on the positive aspect first. Positive lessons that we can learn from Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. First, they make a plan. The text says that they made an appointment together. And often that can be helpful. Right, if we've got a brother or a sister who we know is struggling, all right, we can plan together. Oh, well, let's, let's do something with them. Let's spend some time with them. Let's put together a meal list for them. And generally, we're pretty good at that. But sometimes a person who is in crisis isn't really equipped to tell you what they need. Uh, and that's, that's something we need to be mindful of 
Um, I, this, this is something I'm, I shouldn't say guilty of. It's not exactly bad or anything, but th this, it's something that I do all the time, where if somebody is struggling with something and I don't really know what to do <laughs> or what to say, I, I will just put out something like, well, you know, if there is anything that we can do, if there's anything that you need, please let us know. And that's, again, that's fine enough as a sentiment. It's not particularly useful because a lot of times the person that you're talking to doesn't know what they need. The text shows us these three friends and they just, they get together and decide just between the three of them, we need to go sit with our friend Job. The text doesn't tell us that they sent a messenger to Job ahead of time asking if he'd like them to come over and it doesn't, they don't send a messenger to Job, we're so sorry for what's happened, let us know if you need anything. They simply, they took the initiative. Now we should use discernment when we know a brother or a sister's in distress and something is weighing them down. Uh, but it may be that we need to take the initiative in doing something for them. So that's one lesson that we can learn from Job's three friends, one positive lesson. A second thing that we can learn from them positively is from what they do. The, again, the most good that they do is that they are with Job. They're simply present with him. Is it's good for a person to know that they have support and that their distress hasn't driven their brothers or sisters away from them. In Job's case, it also seems helpful that they mourn with him. They share in his distress. He's there in sackcloth and ashes sitting on the ground. And they raise their voices, they weep, they tear their robes, they sprinkle dust on themselves, and they sit down on the ground. Now, so they're sharing in his distress. In our day and age, this can be something as simple as expressing our condolences for the, the fearful thing that somebody is facing down, expressing our love for them. It can be as simple as sending a card to someone or praying together with them over the thing they're worried about. But of course, it also includes visits, just spending time sitting. And you don't have to have an agenda for it. Maybe you're just sitting around watching Jeopardy or whatever's on TV. I don't even know what's on TV in the daytime anymore. But whatever is, you sit around and spend some time together. Hey, and this is, this is the most useful, most helpful thing that Job's friends do. But the final positive lesson that we can learn from these three men is the value of silence. Their presence and their sympathy are enough for those seven days that they are there. So again, sometimes it is these little things that help our friends the most. Of course, the trouble starts when they decide that it is their duty to say something helpful. And this is where we get into negative lessons that we learn from these three friends. Our reading from the beginning of this lesson comes from the first of the three friends, Eliphaz the Temanite. He started talking all the way back at the beginning of chapter 4. All right, chapter 3, Job is lamenting what has happened to him. He, and as a person in distress sometimes does, he, he laments the fact that he's even alive. All right. Why did I not die at birth, come out from the womb and expire, Job asks. And that kind of talk can be difficult to endure. But Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar don't help anything in the way that they choose to answer Job. And in fact, we, we know that they don't help anything because God comes out at the end of the story and tells us as much. 
that all of this stuff that they say is wrong, is useless, that they need to repent of it, that they need Job to pray for them. Uh, part of that answer is what we just read in chapter 5, starting in verse 8. Job, Eliphaz is the first one to open his mouth and give Job some advice. At best, Eliphaz's words come across as trite. They are the be warmed and filled of comfort speech. They're not actually helpful. Right, Behold, blessed is the one whom God reproves. Therefore, despise not the discipline of the Almighty. For he wounds, but he binds up. He shatters, but his hands heal. He will deliver you from six troubles. In seven, no evil shall touch you. In famine, he will redeem you from death and in war from the power of the sword. None of this is particularly useful. Again, it's... It's essentially the be warmed and filled of comforting speech. And in places, Eliphaz and his friends are basically just dismissive of Job's trouble. Maybe that's not what they mean, but that's the way they come across. At worst, their words imply that Job's distress is his own failing. Like at the beginning of our reading in verse 8, As for me, I would seek God, and to God would I commit my cause. Oh, really? Is that what you would do, Eliphaz? Thank you for that insight. I had not thought of that before. I mean, I only offer sacrifices for myself and my own children all the time. Pray all the time. All right, they're talking about Job's life. But you know what, I really, I really had not thought about seeking God and committing my cause to him. Very helpful. But anyway, the, the implication there is that Job hasn't been doing those things. And that that's why he's in his distress. Eliphaz almost makes it sound like Job's an unbeliever. And right, we've got to take care in this. If I see a mature brother or sister in the faith struggling with something, am I going to start treating them like novices or like unbelievers? I sure hope not. And what I want us to notice about this reading is that it contains a lot of truisms. It, Eliphaz says stuff that in certain contexts is just true. God does great things, unsearchable things, marvelous things without number. He gives rain on the earth and sends waters on the fields. He sets on high those who are lowly and those who mourn are lifted to safety. Right? He says a lot of things that we could hear from like the Virgin Mary or from the Apostle Paul. Yeah, things that are true. And this teaches us something that too few people understand, I think. That even true words can be spoken badly. The truth can be spoken to no effect or to bad effect. That's why Paul instructs us in another place. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. Because just because we are speaking something that is true does not mean that we need to be speaking it in that moment. It does not mean that we are putting it to good effect, that we're being useful. And again, most importantly, it, it, what, what we say that we're concerned about in speaking the truth is representing God truthfully, representing God well. And by the end of this book, what does God himself say about the way that Eliphaz and, uh, and Zophar and Bildad have been representing him? They've not been doing it. 
they've done it wrong, despite the true things that they say. And time fails us to consider all of the untrue things that Job's friends say about him and his situation. Yeah, this, this takes place over the course of 30 some odd chapters where they're just constantly, uh, they're just saying, it, it, by the end of this book, it's like they're just saying everything that they could think to say. Some of it's true, some of it's nonsense. And a lot of it is nonsense about Job. They make a lot of assumptions about Job. And worse, they make assumptions about God. We, we caught a little bit of it uh, in verse 17. Behold, blessed is the one whom God reproves. Therefore, despise not the discipline of the Almighty. Now, again, and this goes back to what we said, is that true or is it false? That's absolutely true. The Hebrew writer tells us that. I mean, we could read it in other places, too. Is Eliphaz speaking rightly to Job here? He's not. Because what's he assuming about this situation? Yeah, he's making assumptions about Job and he's making assumptions about God. That everything that has happened to Job is a matter of God reproving and disciplining him. And in this circumstance, that is not true. Now, we as readers know it because in the first couple of chapters of the book, we can see what's going on behind the scenes. We know exactly what's going on. But put yourself in Eliphaz's shoes for a minute. Does Eliphaz know why Job has lost everything? Does he know about these conversations that the adversary has had with the Lord? and the terms that the Lord has set, the, the boundaries and restrictions that the Lord has set. Eliphaz doesn't know any of that. But what's Eliphaz doing here? He is speaking in ignorance. He is running his mouth. And this is one of the worst impulses that we have Eliphaz, and then the, again, the rest of the other two friends do this all through the book as well. They reflect this common tendency that basically everybody has to feel like you've got to say something. Or you might not have any idea what you're talking about, but you need to say something. Right, brethren, resist that urge. Because we see what happens. Jo the book of Job shows us what happens when we feel like we got to say something, but we don't know what we're talking about, and so we just run our mouths. If we have nothing true and helpful, that's and, true and helpful to say to a brother or a sister in distress, it would be better if we said nothing. Now, that's, that's one side of things. Like I said at the beginning, we use this word anxiety in a few different senses. Sometimes we can discern that a brother or sister is anxious in that other sense. We spent a couple of weeks talking about the error that the scriptures name worry or anxiety or a few other names. Things like projecting into the future, like we talked about from Matthew 6. Right, Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. You know, enough for today is its own trouble. All right, or focusing on earthly things rather than heavenly things. Like we talked about that also from Matthew 6 and from Philippians 4. And sometimes it is apparent that a brother or sister has fallen into that kind of error. How do we respond to that brother or sister? Well, consider a couple of Proverbs of Solomon. Uh, I'm going to read Proverb 27, verse 6, and then also verse 9. Proverbs 27, 6, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, and profuse are the kisses of an enemy. 
verse 9. Oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest, that is, his sincere counsel. All right, what's it mean? Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Sometimes a difficult word is called for. And your friend is the one who is willing to speak that difficult word to you. Now, the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. In, in our auditorium study in Matthew, we've recently had cause to look at all of the, in fact, it's still up on the board. Uh, we've had time or occasion to look at all of the times that Jesus told the disciples that they suffered from little faith. And it's always in a time of crisis, at times where their focus is earthly rather than heavenly. Right, like in Matthew chapter 8, when they are sailing across the Sea of Galilee and a storm blows up and they uh, think they are about to, uh, that the boat's about to capsize and they're about to sink and die. And they turn to Jesus and they say, Master, save us, we're perishing. And in Matthew 8, 26, he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? And then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea and there was a great calm. Or again in Matthew 14, where again they are sailing across the sea and there's a big storm. Uh, but this time, Jesus isn't with them. And then, lo and behold, they look out. This is in the dead of night. They're fighting a squall, trying to keep the ship uh, <laughs> from basically from just falling over and sinking. And they look out and they see out on the water... Jesus just walking on the surface of the water. And at first they think it's a ghost, but then Jesus assures them, no, it's actually me. And Peter takes this daring step. He decides, Lord, if you're willing, call me out on the water. And so Peter walks out. And he looks around. As he's walking on the surface of the water, he looks around and the storm starts to spook him, and he starts to sink. And he cries out, save me. And we read in Matthew 14, verse 31, Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And it happens again in chapter 16. O oh, you of little faith, why were you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? And again in chapter 17, verse 20, he said to them that they could not cast out the demon that they had been presented with because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it'll move and nothing will be impossible for you. And again, this is, this is the same word that Jesus uses when he's talking to us in Matthew 6, verse 30. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Jesus does not hesitate to tell the disciples and to tell us uh, that we're guilty of having little faith when we need to hear it. Well, even here, I think it's worth, uh, worth our notice that in every one of those cases, he saves those who are perishing. And he bears with these disciples of his for three years he doesn't give up on them. And so there are times where if we see a brother or sister falling into error, we do need to say a difficult word to them. You know, faithful are the wounds of a friend. 
But as we are doing that, to remember what the purpose is and to imitate our Lord, that what we're looking to do is not just to admonish somebody, but we're looking to cause them to grow more and more into the faith of Jesus Christ. And that that's something that is going to require patience, is going to require long-suffering. Again, Jesus bore with them for three years. So as we consider our brothers and sisters when they suffer from time to time, we should use our God-given discernment to address them in the most appropriate way. Right, those who suffer, we are to comfort. Those who are erring, we are to correct patiently. And let me suggest that if you lack the discernment to tell the difference between those two types of people, you're, you might not be the person who needs to be involved in that situation anyway. If you don't have the discernment, the wisdom, to tell the difference between those two types of people, you might not have the wisdom or discernment yet to address that situation the way it needs to be addressed. And you might need to leave that to somebody else. Let us remember the lessons of Job's three friends so that we do all of these things fruitfully. Right? Make that appointment. Sit on that ground. Keep your mouth shut when it would best be shut, but don't hesitate to open it when it needs to be open. What the Lord has called us to together as a church is to strengthen and uplift one another. And that is one of the reasons why we are here. That is one of the reasons why the Hebrew writer admonishes us not to neglect the assembling of ourselves. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and to good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. In all of this, the aim is for us to be building each other up so that we're all heading down that straight and narrow path, heading towards that heavenly goal together. And in light of that, we urge everyone who is here, who is not on that straight and narrow, to get on that straight and narrow, to obey the gospel, to obey the will of the Lord. What our Lord asks of us is relatively simple and easy. We urge you this morning to believe the good news of Jesus Christ, that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God, that he died to save us from our sins, and that he was raised on the third day to conquer death and to give us the promise of eternal life. Believe that good news. Turn away from the sinful ways of this world. Confess Jesus as Lord and be baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection for the cleansing of your sins. If you're subject to that invitation, won't you make your need known by coming forward as together we stand and sing.